Burning Shores has brought us nine new legendary weapons, six you can buy and three you can pick up in quests, including one totally new type, the Spectre Gauntlet, which I've got some tips for using by the way. Plus, there's a super unique Easter Egg bow you can find by exploring, and the Purple Black Tide Sharp Shot bow if you pre-ordered. So let's go over all the new weapons, show you where to get each one, and see how they compare to the existing legendaries to help you decide which ones are best for you. As soon as you arrive in Fleet's End, the new settlement, you'll find six of the new legendary weapons for sale at the Hunter Merchant. Each one costs eight Brimshine, a new special resource you can find around the map. If you want to purchase and upgrade all the new gear, including weapons, outfits, coils, and weaves, you're going to need a lot of Brimshine. 210 pieces in total, plus an additional six if you want to upgrade the Black Tide Quen Commander pre-order bonus outfit. So you'll definitely want to be on the lookout for Brimshine as you play. There's at least 215 in a single playthrough, but I don't know of anyone who's gotten more than that, so if you pre-ordered, you may be one short of buying and upgrading everything. Either way, it definitely takes some work to find enough brimshine, so let me give you a few tips. For an easy 8 pieces, head over to this cave in the cliff just east of Fleet's End. If you have trouble figuring out the puzzle, I'll link my part 1 playthrough down below where I did it at the 2 hour mark. For 8 more, fly a bit further southeast to find a 3 piece directly between the Slaughter Spine and Thunderjaw sites. Then in a tower directly northeast of the Thunderjaw site, there's a chunk of five about halfway up, which also happens to be where you'll find the toy suction cup bow, a cool little easter egg reference to The Last of Us Part 2. As part of the first main quest, you'll have to climb another tower nearby. Once you're done with the quest up at the top, check on a ledge above the main platform for a brimshine chunk worth three. There are also a few inside the tower on the way up, but the biggest single cache of brimshine is the one at the end of the Delver Camp treasure hunt side activity. You'll get 15 at the end, and many of the stopping points along the way have three to five as well. You can't just skip to the end for the 15 though, so you'll have to start at the Delver's camp right here and then find all 7 of the clues before the treasure is revealed. I'll link a guide for it down below. It's also worth doing the 4 new arena challenges, which will reward you with a total of 17 brimshine plus some new elite outfit weaves. If you're struggling with these challenges, stay tuned for my guide for them. And if you guys find these brimshine tips helpful, leaving a like on this video would be much appreciated. Other than those few spots, the best way to track down more brimshine is to create a job for an item that requires it. Which will put a marker on your map to the nearest piece. It's smart to use a weapon or outfit to start a job repeatedly because they cost 8. So you can go find 8 at a time, buy cheaper items like coils or do some upgrades, then start the same job for 8 again. Also, if you're being routed to a Brimshine location you can't access for some reason, just fast travel somewhere else on the map and the Brimshine tracking will update to show you a new location. Lava flows always seem to have a few pieces along them, so I'd recommend searching around those as well. Of course, you'll want to spend some of that Brimshine straight away, so let's see which of the new weapons are worth it. First, I think most people will want to pick up the tie that binds, the new legendary rope caster. Comparing it to the elite rope caster, our previous best option, it's pretty clear the tie that binds is a significant upgrade. It has stronger ropes to allow faster tie downs. Plus, it has a new explosive canister ammo that's actually pretty good. These work well with tie downs because you can peg them onto machines or the ground near machines and easily trigger the explosions for extra damage. The tie that binds also has stronger plasma ropes than the elite, but elemental ropes are pretty weak overall. All, so I don't recommend using them. Perhaps the biggest benefit of this rope caster though are the additional perks, particularly the boost for reload and draw speed, which allow you to fire off ropes more quickly. On top of that, we also get 5 coil slots at the legendary level, so you can make it even faster with draw and reload speed coils. I've been using 3 of the new elite overdraw coils, because they boost both reload and draw speed, plus 2 explosive coils to boost those canisters a bit. But you could also go full elite overdraw or a mix of purple draw speed and reload coils. As I mentioned, mentioned in my starting tips video, having a solid rope caster in the Burning Shores is important because you'll often be fighting large groups of machines, so picking up the tie that binds early is a smart move. The next weapon I think you should consider is Gravesinger's Lament, the new Sharpshot bow. Compared to Erev's Downfall, we see that instead of elite precision and tear blast arrows, the Gravesinger has strike through and knockdown. I'm not terribly excited about knockdown arrows, as even these advanced versions with their hidden 150 knockdown power stat don't trigger knockdowns as easily as drill spikes. I do really like the 
edition of Strike Through Arrows though. These are excellent against human enemies in particular because they deal damage through armor. The Gravesinger also now happens to have the strongest advanced precision arrows on any sharpshot bow. Of course, they aren't as strong as the elite arrows on Erevs, but personally, I rarely use those during normal gameplay anyway because they're so expensive to craft. I think having stronger advanced arrows is a win. Plus, I really like the 40% draw speed bonus on the Gravesinger. It's not quite as fast as the hidden draw speed bonus on the Delta, which it still appears to have as of patch 1.22, but it's noticeably faster than Erevs. For these two reasons, the Gravesinger has replaced Erevs on my weapon wheel for now, but I'm not totally convinced yet because of the other perks. 25% stealth damage is solid, but personally I don't play very stealthy, so that's really only going to come into play for my opening shot. Although, you can trigger it mid-combat with a smoke bomb. Multiple enemy damage can be hard to trigger, as it will only apply when using strike-through arrows that hit multiple enemies. I'm not normally a fan of instant chance perks, but instant brittle is definitely the best option, so I think it's a bit better than the instant shock and explosive chance on Erevs. I do really like the concentration and critical hit damage perks on Erevs though, so I'm a bit torn, but I'll keep testing the Gravesinger for now. Either way, I'm rolling with five of the new elite critical hit coils, which, by the way, you can actually get two copies of if you loot the Zenith drone at the end of the first main quest before talking to Seika and then again after talking with her. If you're wondering how I got five though, stay tuned, because I may just have a new duplication glitch for you guys. I'll also have more coiling recommendations in a dedicated video coming soon. Next, I want to take a look at the new Bolt Blaster, Eternal Vengeance. This is an interesting one, because unlike the Blast Forge and Brawl Breaker, it doesn't have advanced bolts, only regular, piercing, and shock. The regular ones are pretty weak, and the shock bolts aren't really anything special, but the piercing bolts are actually pretty nice. Maxing out at 46 impact damage, they don't quite match the Blast Forge's advanced bolts at 50, but they're close, and piercing bolts deal full damage through armor plates. Of course, this is irrelevant if you've frosted a machine first, since the brittle state negates armor effects. But piercing bolts are pretty nice on heavily armored machines that aren't frosted to make sure you aren't missing out on damage. Taking a look at the perks, we can see that Eternal Vengeance is geared towards playing up close. So I actually think this Bolt Blaster could be good for a melee build. Combining its 25% close range damage perk with 5 of the same coil will give you a 2.5x multiplier. Plus, you can get another 40% boost from the melee follow-up perk by giving a machine a quick whack. So Eternal Vengeance can actually deal more damage than the Blast Forge, but you have to play up close. I also like the Instant Explosion perk better than Instant Shock, as it won't override the brittle state you've applied. Similar to the Gravesinger Sharpshot Bow, I'm going to play with Eternal Vengeance in my loadout for a while to put it through its paces. Those of you who want the absolute max damage out of your Bolt Blaster will still like the Brawl Breaker, since it has the strongest advanced bolts, but the 8% Instant Slow chance overriding my brittle states drives me crazy, so I personally don't use it. Speaking of the brittle state, the new Eye of the Storm Elemental Warrior Bow is actually a great tool for applying that. Of course, you could load it up with frost coils and use its frost arrows to apply frost buildup, but the better way to coil it is with the new Elite Frost Coils, because they each have a 5% chance to trigger the brittle state instantly. Plus, Eye of the Storm has a built-in 6% instant corroding chance. Instant chances actually pool together, so even though this is 6% corroding, it will actually contribute to the chance of triggering the brittle state too. So, altogether, we have a 31% chance for any shot to instantly trigger the brittle state. In other words, it will take you about three shots on average to apply brittle to any machine, regardless of how resistant they are to frost. And remember, we're using super cheap warrior bow ammo, not advanced hunter arrows like on the Sun Scourge that cost volatile sludge. Before the Burning Shores, we used to do this instant frost build with the 3% instant brittle coils on the Reign of Sparks, but that bow won't work with the new elite frost coils because it doesn't have frost ammo. Of course, using a warrior bow means we sacrifice range, but I'm going to play around with this for a while to see if it can replace my Sun Scourge as a more resource efficient tool. Now, the remaining two legendaries available at the Merchant aren't particularly interesting to me. The new Shredder Distant Thunder is a slight upgrade compared to the final chapter, although it doesn't pair as nicely with the Ancestor's Return because instead of a shocked enemy perk, it gives bonus damage against enemies drenched in purge water. I do like the long range, knockdown power, and critical hit damage perks though, and the advanced and piercing Shredders are a bit stronger too. But for me, the Ancestor's Return still reigns supreme. The hidden tear damage on elemental shredders is just so strong, and shock shredders repeatedly immobilizing enemies can be really OP. The new Emperor's Reign Hunter Bow is also a bit disappointing. Its advanced hunter arrows do have the highest impact and tear damage stats, beating out the Tears of the Land God by a few points, but the TLG's arrows were already so strong that this small boost really isn't necessary. The TLG's perks are also much better, as they virtually all make it easier to tear off components, which is how I recommend you use a hunter bow. The perks on the Emperor's Reign do 
do make it a pretty good option for a melee build, but I think a lot of people interested in that playstyle will be drawn to warrior bows instead, so the Emperor's Reign sits in a weird spot. If you like the Machine Master playstyle, you might like it for the targeting and berserk arrows, but the TLG and Death Seeker also have targeting arrows, and I think berserk is better applied with the new berserk blast Valor Surge. It's true you can't use that all the time though, so if you really like making machines fight each other, this might be a bow for you. If you pre-ordered Burning Shores, then you can also buy the purple rarity Black Tide Sharp Shot Bow at the Hunter Merchant for one shard. There's not much to say about this one. For a purple bow, it's got a good set of perks, but compared to the Delta, Glow Blast, and Regala's Wrath, which share the same ammo types, it just doesn't stack up. And it's definitely not competing with any legendary Sharp Shot Bow. So at least if you didn't pre-order, you're not missing out on anything. Thanks to my friends Jerry, Arteku, and Twinge for pulling these clips of the Black Tide together for me, as my review code didn't include the pre-order items. So those are all the new weapons you can buy, but we've got a few more that come from quests. The first one is the Skyhammer Elemental Blast Sling. This comes from a chest inside the facility during Heaven and Earth. And don't worry, if you miss it, you can easily go back later. The Skyhammer is another solid choice for applying frost. Loaded up with elite frost coils, its bombs don't have quite as much frost buildup as the Sun Scourge. But elemental bombs don't require volatile sludge to craft, and the elemental pools on the ground will continue to build up the state passively. It's not as cheap as the Eye of the Storm Instant Brittle build, but the Skyhammer definitely offers another resource efficient way to apply frost. Now, my personal favorite new weapon is the Last Argument Spike Thrower, which, coincidentally, comes from completing a quest with one of my favorite characters, Gildan. You'll find Gildan in the Murmuring Hollow Relic Ruin over here, and he'll reward you with the Last Argument after completing the side quest A Friend in the Dark. I like Last Argument so much because it finally brings us legendary drill spikes. As many of you know, I like using drill spikes to trigger knockdowns, which you can learn all about in my damage types video linked below. Drill spikes are great for dealing damage too though. True, the last arguments aren't much stronger than the Vindicators, but as a legendary we get 5 coil slots and more perks to boost the damage. The perks are solid too, boosting both the knockdown and damage potential. The new elite knockdown coils are a perfect match for this spike thrower, but going for 5 is overkill in terms of knockdown power. So I've been using 2 plus 3 of the new elite overdraw coils to boost reload and draw speed. Plus, I'll still get maximum knockdown power each time I overdraw the throw, which happens most of the time. Oh, and if you like explosive spikes, Last Argument happens to have the most powerful version of those as well. The last new weapon, and also the most unique, is the Spectre Gauntlet. You'll get this at the end of the Stars in Their Eyes main quest, so you can't miss it. But you can miss the powerful railgun upgrade for it that comes from a side quest called In His Wake. You can start this over here immediately after completing the quest where you get the gauntlet, and I definitely recommend doing it. The gauntlet has a lot of nuanced mechanics that we don't have time to fully dive into here, so I'll probably do a masterclass video on it, but let me give you some of the most important tips. You pretty much always want to use the gauntlet's weapon technique to place a designator on your target. The basic shard barrage ammo will home in on the designator to focus their damage, and if you use this ammo type, you'll want to stop firing just before the clip of 10 runs out to avoid a nearly 4 second cooldown. But for the most damage, you want to hit designators with the railgun. Doing this will result in a pretty good hit, but you can get just silly numbers if you get lucky with the shrapnel bits dealing extra damage. We're not sure if it's intentional or a bug, and we're researching it more over on my Discord server, but it seems that you'll generate shrapnel most consistently when the railgun shots hit a designator through a machine's body. The shrapnel bits will cascade down and deal damage to anything they touch, even dealing damage while on the ground if a machine gets close to them. So for example, it works well to place the designator high up on a slaughter spine's sail because you'll likely shoot through the plasma launchers to hit it, generating shrapnel that will fall down and hit the slaughter spine's body. It's difficult to do consistently, but when you can pull it off, a single railgun shot through a machine can generate a lot of shrapnel that deals massive damage. As I mentioned, I'd like to do a dedicated video on the Spectre Gauntlet once we have a better understanding of how it works. So if you guys are looking forward to that, or if you found this video helpful, leaving a like down below would be much appreciated. And if you want to get a jump start on optimizing your weapon coils, you should definitely check out this video right here. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.